This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 56 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, 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 everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on the Homestead Journey. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And as I record this episode, this is November of 2020, and you know what that means. We are celebrating the one-year anniversary of the Homestead Journey podcast. Cue the music. That's right, everyone. We are celebrating one year of our journey together towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Can you believe it? This episode actually marks one year of our journey together. Last year, November 11th, 2019, is when we launched this podcast. And so thank you, those of you who have been with me since the very beginning, those of you who are new, thank you as well. I am so glad that you have found the podcast. Now, this month, all month long, we are celebrating with some giveaways. So we are going to be giving away some handcrafted mugs from creekroadpottery.com, as well as some t-shirts from our brand new Teespring site. So we have a shop now over on Teespring. It's teespring.com, T-E-E, spring.com slash stores slash the Homestead Journey podcast. I will link to that in the show notes, but we have some t-shirts over there. So if you want to hop over there and support the show by buying some t-shirts, I'd appreciate it. But we are going to be giving away some of those this month. So how can you enter to win? Well, you can enter to win by doing three things. First of all, by simply sharing the Homestead Journey podcast on social media using the hashtag the Homestead Journey podcast. Secondly, you can enter to win by leaving us a review on your preferred podcasting platform. So iTunes or wherever you can leave us a review, two thumbs up, five stars, however you can do it. And then once you've done that, email me, brian at thehomesteadjourney.net, just to make sure I don't miss anything. And finally, you can sign up by hopping over to giveaway.thehomesteadjourney.net slash birthday and sign up there to be entered to win fabulous prizes. Now, we're also celebrating a couple of other ways. I gave a sneak peek this week. Now, I say that five times fast. Sounds kind of like Dr. Seuss, right? A sneak peek this week over on our social media accounts on Instagram and Facebook. So if you're not following us, you definitely want to do that. But a sneak peek at some printables that I am putting together. I'm actually trying to put together a homestead journal. And so I'm going to be releasing that in segments that will be applicable to the season in which I release it. So over the next about a year, I'll be releasing kind of chunks that you can print out and put in a three ring binder. And it should hopefully help you keep track of your homestead. And uh, I'm really excited about doing this. Hopefully you'll find it helpful. I'm looking forward to the feedback that I get from people on ways to make it better and tweak it to make it more user friendly. So just Stay tuned for that. By the end of this month, I will be releasing the first segment. I've got a few other things up my sleeve that I'm excited about. Not going to reveal them this week, but definitely stay tuned for some more exciting news as we journey through November, celebrating the one-year anniversary of the Homestead Journey podcast. With all of that said, 
Let's jump over to this week's Homestead Happenings because it was a busy week here on the Homestead and I am excited to bring you up to speed. So the word of the week this week on the homestead was pumpkin, 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 with perhaps a side of squash thrown in. (laughs) It's that time of the year when the local farm stands are starting to close down. There's a local farm that has a corn maze and they ended their season. And so that means produce available. And in particular, pumpkins. And so this week, I was able to get about three and a third loads of pumpkins, as well as one full load of squash for our pigs. Now, this is great because not only is it a relatively low-cost source of food, but it also serves as a natural dewormer for pigs. And so I'm very excited about that. The pigs have been enjoying the pumpkins And so it's just pumpkins, 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 and squash this week. I got a a great workout in because I loaded and unloaded them pretty much by myself. My son did go on Thursday to help me pick up that load, but the rest of it was all me loading hundreds of pumpkins into the truck and then unloading hundreds of pumpkins out of the truck, but so thankful and excited to have those for the pigs. This week, one of the piglets that uh, was born in Vermont went to its new home. I've only sent two boars off of the farm. I've sent a bunch of cut males off, but I've only sent two intact boars off the farm so far. And this week was one of them. And what was really exciting is the gentleman who purchased this boar is new to American guinea hogs, but he is not new to pigs. He has raised other types of pigs, other breeds of pigs for many years, but has decided to go the American guinea hog route. And so he knows pigs very well. And he was so impressed by the temperament of this boar. And so I'm very excited to see what kind of offspring he produces. He's gone to a great home It sounds to me like he's settling in well, and as we work together to try to help the American guinea hog breed recover, I'm just excited to see what Brutus is going to produce in offspring. Now, on Friday this week, I went and picked up some hay, and I'll be using that in the Ruth Stout bed as I put that to bed for the winter, and then that hay also goes to the pigs because while it's been a beautiful week, Weather-wise here, kind of a late Indian summer, that cold weather is right around the corner. And so I picked up some hay to put into their housing to give them a nice, not a feather bed, a hay bed (laughs) to keep them warm and comfortable all winter long. Now yesterday, which was Saturday, I did something, well, my family and I did something that I hope to never, ever, 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 ever do again. And that is for the first time we processed waterfowl here on the homestead. In the past, I've had ducks that I've sent to be processed, but I'd never processed any ducks or geese myself here on the homestead. Well, that changed yesterday. And trust me, folks, when I tell you, If I never do it again, I will be a happy, happy, happy man. I will be a happy, happy, happy man. Now, from my understanding, there's about four different ways that you can process waterfowl. Number one is you can skin it. Very easy, but the downside to that is that you lose out on that beautiful fat that geese and ducks are known for. The second thing you can do is kind of like chickens where you scald it and then put it in a plucker. But what I've read on that is that a lot of people fail to see success because geese and ducks, being waterfowl, have an oil coating on their their feathers that, it stands to reason, keeps water from penetrating them. And so some people will put Dawn dish detergent in the water, other people will put baking soda in the water, and I'm sure there's other 
secret family recipes. But from what I've read, people have varying levels of success with that method. The third method is one where you dry pluck or rough pluck the waterfowl until only the down layer is remaining. And then what you do is you dip the bird into some hot water where you've melted some paraffin wax, and then you take it from there and you put it into an ice bath, which causes that wax to harden up. And then as you peel that wax off, the the feathers, that down disappears, and you are left with a, at least in theory, a beautifully processed bird. It's kind of like a Brazilian bikini wax on a goose. <laughs> That's the method that we chose to use. And folks, it was absolutely brutal. It was brutal, brutal, brutal. I did not enjoy it one bit, not one bit. And if I could come up with some kind of a Dr. Seuss type rhyme, I would because it was miserable. So option number four is to pay somebody else to do it. And I am going to be choosing option number four going forward. <laughs> Let me tell you something, folks. It will be worth every penny of paying somebody else to process those geese and ducks. Now, yes, I like to do as much on my homestead as I possibly can, but this is one where I am very, very happy to outsource it to other people. Now, you may have had better luck in processing geese and ducks, and if you've got a particular tip or trick, I'm all ears. Send me an email, brian at thehomesteadjourney.net. I'd love to hear from you. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm done processing geese and ducks here on the homestead. The last thing I want to share with you is that we did enjoy a goose and a duck today for lunch. We roasted them in the oven. It's the first time I've ever had goose. I've never eaten goose before. I've had duck before. But uh, this was our first go-round with a goose. Now, to be honest with you, I overcooked it a little bit. I was aiming for a rare, medium, rare level, and instead I got more of a medium well. It wasn't overcooked. It was still plenty juicy, and it was still tender, and it was delicious. Absolutely delicious. I enjoyed both the goose and the duck, but I think the general consensus around the table, my mom and dad were here from my wife and my son, I think the general consensus was that people preferred the goose. It was tasty, tasty, tasty. Now, I'll leave a link to the recipes we used. One was from Martha Stewart. One was from the Farmer's Almanac. Very, very good. I enjoyed both. I didn't follow them to a T, but I followed them pretty closely. And overall, I was very happy with the result. Next time, I will cut back a little bit on the time to go for more of that medium rare. But overall, it was awesome. The, the best part of it, though, is as we looked at our plates today, 90 to 95% of the food was from our homestead. It was stuff that either we grew on our homestead, raised on our homestead, or we processed here on our homestead. And folks, let me tell you something. Yes, that goose and that duck tasted great. But that sense of satisfaction, oh my goodness, it is unparalleled. Anyhow, that's what took place here on 3B Farm and Homestead. Now let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. So I am so happy to be joined today by none other than my favorite homesteaders in the entire whole wide world joining me for this one year anniversary episode. Welcome mom and dad from the Humming Bee Homestead. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you, son. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right. All right. So before we jump into this, why don't you just give people a little bit of an idea as far as what you are doing on your homestead, the size, some of the things that you guys are growing and raising. Give us an overview. Don't look at each other like that. Come on now. Somebody got to jump in here. 
Well, I do the raising and she does the canning and freezing and whatever. So I think this year I had close to 40 raised beds. And this year I tried something new. I tried fingerling potatoes. And I think they came out fairly well. I'll do them again next year. I may change the location of them. I've had them on Potato Hill for a long time, and I think it might be best to change the location. The other thing I did was I was a little disappointed with my Brussels sprouts, and yet I got some that were the size of a half dollar. So I think I was kind of happy with them. What else did I do this year? This year I did the, the chickens, the meat birds, and I'll do that again. That was really good. I'm planning on either this fall or next spring putting in a greenhouse to extend my growing period. And you, in the past, you've monkeyed around with meat rabbits, which I have shared mm -hmm. on the podcast, how that ended up getting us into meat rabbits, not of our own choosing. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> and then beyond that, you also, you do raised beds, but you also do a little bit of in-ground gardening, don't you? Yeah, I do some of that. And I also have bees. Bees. Back to the in-ground gardening, before we get to the bees, a big part of the reason why you do raised beds though, is because of the soil composition of where you're at. Yeah, I'm um, heavy clay, heavy clay. And it's a lot easier for me to control the weeds on a raised bed than it is just in the in-ground. Now, you are very, very fortunate that you live next door to a horse farm, and so you have all of the aged horse manure that your heart desires. That I can carry out of there. And so you constantly are going over there with your little garden tractor and a dump. And my straw hat. Your straw hat. And funny story here, he actually was nicknamed the little Germany guy. <laughs> and so when we started going to our new church, a lady that goes to the church that we attend, it's actually her sister, right? Her sister that owns mm -hmm. the horse farm. And so anyhow, one day in conversation, I, I shared with Janet that my dad lived next door to her sister. And she said, what? The little Germany guy. And so that's kind of been, and, the, and how that all came about is my mom and dad were going to visit Germany. And as they were getting ready to leave, I think you went next door to the neighbor and told them that you were going to be gone, asked if they might be able to keep an eye on the, mm -hmm. the house just to make sure everything was okay. <laughs> and anyhow, they nicknamed dad the little Germany guy. And so from <laughs> now until forever, he will always be the little Germany guy to the next door neighbors. Um, so go ahead, Mom. You were going to jump in. Well, I, I just wanted to say that we have just a little over an acre of land. A lot of people think to be homesteaders, you have to have a lot of acreage and you have to have all kinds of animals. But that's really not true. Being a homesteader means that you're growing your own food. You're becoming self-sufficient and you rely on what you can grow there and for, for your own use. It's not that you're trying to s supply the whole grocery store full of, of fresh vegetables and whatever you can grow, but it's mainly for your own use, the sustainability. I forget, Brian, what you, the three words that you use, but on a little over an acre, we can live good throughout the year because we do, we are able to grow our own food there. And so if people think, well, to be a homesteader, I've got to have acres and acres of land. That's, that's just not true. In Langsville, we just had that city lot and we grew a lot of our own food right next door there for growing our growing family. But the problem with that is what happens is if you run out of, say, pizza sauce, you go to the store then and you buy the pizza sauce from the store and it tastes so inferior that you really don't like it anymore. You like your homegrown uh, vegetables and, and things that you actually can yourself because even in the winter, they taste so much fresher. Yeah, absolutely great points. And so <clears throat> before we jump into that too far, and you guys are answering questions I've even asked, which is great. I'm loving it. So you guys 
grow a lot of vegetables. You do meat birds, you did meat rabbits, you do raised beds, you do in-ground gardening, you have bees, all on an acre of land. Fruit trees, you have currants. What, do you have any other berry bushes? Do you have? Uh, what's those that we? Yeah, elderberries. Elderberries? Yeah. Elderberries, for sure. So, so you guys are doing a lot on an acre of land. And not only are you growing it, but you're preserving it. So do you have any idea how many jars you canned up this year? Do you, I, do you, do you I, keep track? I didn't keep track, but I would say it's probably close to a thousand. Yeah. I, I mean, they... They can way more than I do. And in fact, it, I think I've shared on our Facebook and Instagram accounts pictures of their pantry. And uh, it's just absolutely amazing. It's awe-inspiring. And uh, again, like I said, these are my two favorite homesteaders in the, in the whole wide world. But a big part of that is because of the example that they set by doing the best they can with what they've got. Because at the end of the day, their ground, again, as dad said, it's clay. It's not the best ground for a vegetable garden and yet they they've made the best of the of that situation by some hard work some some heavy lifting shoveling shoveling each uh wheel not wheelbarrow load but it's a dump cart load of horse manure for 40 some odd raised beds and then um weeding them and sometimes not weeding them, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> and then canning that food, preserving that food. I think this year you got a dehydrator out. You had a dehydrator, but I'd like to think that I kind of encouraged you and inspired you to get that out of the uh, basement. Yeah, that we, correct? we tried dehydra dehydrating vegetables this year for, I think, the first time. And I'm really liking it because especially like the kale, we dehydrated kale. Now when we have soup, I just sprinkle some of the kale, dried kale in there, and it adds a lot of nutrients to the soup. We also did onions and we did green peppers, but I haven't actually used those yet because I still have some fresh onions and I have some uh, frozen peppers that I've been using. And now, obviously, on an acre of land, there's some things that you can't raise. Or up to this point, you haven't been able to grow. Like the, the quantity of apples, for example, that you would want to have for applesauce and apple slices and things mm. like that. We have to go next door and get them. Yeah, mm. you've got to go somewhere else to get that. However, we have room for a few more trees. We haven't, for some reason, got them planted but we do have room for a few trees. If we would get them planted, there would be a lot of applesauce that we could get from our own apples. Now, as far as pigs go, right now... Why you, should I raise them when you do? That's exactly it. And that's what I'm getting at. As far as being a homesteader, you don't necessarily have to raise and grow everything. You know, you guys have bought a pig from me in the past, but we've also done some barter this year where I needed some jars. Dad picked up some jars at the at Walmart and brought them down to me and said, okay, we'll apply this towards the cost of the pig. Being a homesteader doesn't mean that you necessarily raise and grow everything, but it means that you find creative ways. Uh, and sometimes it's a matter of you buy apples and you can applesauce. Sometimes it means you buy a pig or you barter for a pig and you put that into your freezer. But all of that is still a part of homesteading from my perspective. Well, Would you agree? I, I think to be a homesteader, you need to be a part of a homesteading group where you can't raise everything yourself. But if, like you said about bartering, if you know somebody that raises something and trade them back and forth, it takes the heaviness out of both of you. In other words, it's not like I have to raise all the apples, but if I can trade, say, my pumpkins for the apples, we're both benefiting. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's what you guys are doing right now on your homestead. And to give people an idea, you guys are about 15 minutes away from us. 15. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's close enough, <laughs> but far enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, but mom and dad when we are on vacation dad will come down a lot and do chores for me and we do the same thing when mom and dad go on vacation we we go up we do chores for them and i keep an eye on their place um although not quite as well as 
the next door neighbor, keeping an eye on the Germany guys, Homestead. So let's go back. Let's go back in time and let's start at the very beginning for you guys, because I've shared on the podcast that I feel like we grew up to a certain extent as homesteaders where, where people might have considered us to be homesteaders, but we didn't really call ourselves that. And I think that at, at various times in our lives, there's kind of been different seasons, I guess I would say. When we lived here in New York, in Victory, I would say we were a little bit more in, in that homesteader type lifestyle. Then as we were in Hadley, it wasn't quite so much there. Mm-hmm. Then when we went to Pennsylvania, dad referenced Linesville, that was Pennsylvania where he was a pastor. We did a lot of raising and growing uh, of food there and preserving food there. And then as you guys went to Brazil, so I kind of feel like as I grew up, there were different seasons where people would have considered us homesteaders and then other times when people maybe wouldn't have considered us homesteaders. But even taking a step back beyond that, Tell me a little bit about how you guys grew up, because I think there was a certain aspect of that for both of you. Is that a fair statement? I grew up in a fairly good sized town, Johnstown. My dad had a big garden every year, but for whatever reason, my mom never did much canning. Sometimes she would give the vegetables to my sister and say to her, Millie, you you can this up for me on shares. You keep some for yourself and then give some back. Well, I would go up to my sister's house where she was canning and I learned to love to can. And so one day, it wasn't long ago, I said to my sister, I said, boy, I really thank you. I appreciate uh, you teaching me to learn to love to can. And she said, to love it? And I said, yeah. I said, you love to can, you pass that on to me. I love to can. She said, I did it out of necessity, not out of love. But they always had a huge garden there. And they had a big family. And so she would can it up. But with helping her, I learned to love to put those vegetables in the jars and then have them for later use. And so that's basically where my canning skills started was there. Dad? Probably gardening started in third grade in Canajahari. Remember a big garden with lots of tomatoes. And then when we moved to Dorset, I sold vegetable seeds for something to do. And of course you have extras left over. So um, <clears throat> planted them out in the back of the house. But also probably... In fourth grade, we went up to North Ferrisburg to where Grandma was raised. And there was a guy up there, and they had, I considered them wild, um, uh, the little chickens. Bantams? Bantams. And I came back with a trio in a cardboard box in back of the car. And put them in a Quonset hut. And before you knew it, I had a whole lot of bantams. (laughs) They're almost as good as rabbits. (laughs) And so that started me in the chicken business in fourth grade. And then we moved to Westernville. And there we had a really big garden. And I was in FFA. So I I learned a lot about gardening, a lot about uh, crop rotation, a lot about judging weeds, that kind of stuff. Probably where I really got involved in homesteading was actually when I was in college, I would go up to Uncle Murs and Aunt Eva's. And there I learned how to make maple syrup. There I learned how we did V8 juice. There I learned how to make yogurt. Aunt Eva was a lot into this um, Roostout. She was into Roostout, and she had huge gardens full of weeds. And we'd go out and dig through the weeds to find the vegetables. But there are things where I really learned to compost and 
really got involved in homesteading was there at Uncle Mers and Ann Eva's. One thing, too, is when you mentioned about Victory Mills, of course, Dad grew the gardens, but I don't like to see anything go to waste. So instead of letting the vegetables go to waste, I would put them in a can and properly can them, and then we would enjoy them all winter long. But because of learning to love to can from somebody who didn't, I enjoyed taking those vegetables and preserving them and feeling like I was giving my family something very, very healthy. And from there, it just escalated. Um, what was interesting was mom canned up a bunch of small um, green cherry tomatoes and canned them as dill, dill to tomatoes, dill right? Tomatoes. Yeah. Dill tomatoes. And we really tomatoes. didn't care for them. But where I worked, like on Friday, we'd have like snack day and everybody would bring something in. And one day I thought, well, I'll just get rid of some of these green cherry tomatoes. So I cut them up and took them to work. And there was a guy there by the name of Sully. And he said, oh, I love these. These are just like my grandmother used to make. And I'm thinking, no, oh, you do. Would you like some? And I think I'm sold them for like a dollar fifty a jar or something. I I mean, there was like a dozen jars or so that we didn't like and he loved them so we pawned them off onto him. And you know the funny thing is for me, I I look back on especially especially when we still lived here in New York. And I remember we did the meat rabbits until the dogs the, the dogs got into the meat rabbits. Yeah. And that was a horrible, horrible day for us. I also remember as as a kid, Papa was raising chickens. I think he raised a couple hundred chickens, and we would go to his house one day in the fall, and we would have a chicken butchering day, and kind of everybody had a task. <laughs> the task for us kids was to find the chickens after they ran off into the cornfield corn field with no heads because Papa used the chop and drop method. Uh, chop the heads off and drop them. <laughs> Let them go. Um, and so... I remember as kids, we thought that was highly entertaining. They, they would probably <laughs> submit us to the school psychologist now, but I remember doing that. <laughs> Papa would also grow a lot of sweet corn, and we would get together, and uh, we would do up sweet sweet corn as a family. And so there were a lot of things like that that I remember doing as a family, and it kind of goes back to what you were talking about, Mom, from the standpoint of community. Sometimes the community is other people in your family, doing it together with aunts and uncles and moms and dads and and sometimes grandmas and grandpas and sometimes it's doing it with other homesteaders but again it's a matter of if somebody can grow in great quantities like papa was able to grow sweet corn in great quantities he was able to raise chickens in great quantities he would raise a couple of pigs every year um i remember that as a, as a kid um he would do i think he did goats and sheep one time and i remember him doing turkeys and ducks um, and I wish you would have talked me out of doing ducks. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, again, I remember doing all of that as as a kid, and and it's it's amazing to me how much that has influenced me now later on in life. Because to a certain extent, after we you know we moved to Pennsylvania, and you did a lot of that stuff, but it wasn't in the context of community like we had done it here. And then, obviously, then we kind of sojourned throughout the world, literally, to Brazil and, and so on and so forth and kind of got away from some of that. And then we came back here, what, 2007? You guys came back here 2008 or nine, 2009? And I think then we've reconnected back to these paths, shall we say. Now, again, like I said, we didn't necessarily refer to ourselves as homesteaders at that point. Right? Did you ever? You never would have considered yourself a homesteader um, when we were younger. No. We, it was just life to us. It was just living. Well, it it was more than that because, and I, I to this day feel feel this way. I feel like my home canned foods are much more nutritious than what you get out of the store. They taste better, but because you take them from the vine and put them in the jar within a few hours, the nutrients are still there. And so I think we have better health 
because of what we have canned and what we have put up ourselves than what you can buy in the store. I, I definitely yeah, it, it wasn't or it wasn't homesteading to to meet with more um, organic gardening. I think mm -hmm. staying away from the pesticides and herbicides and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think you were probably the first person I remember using the term homesteader, and that was kind of after you bought this property that you have now. You started referring to it as the humming bee homestead. And I have to confess, <laughs> when you did that, I kind of rolled my eyes a little bit because I don't know what it is or what it was about the term homesteader, but that was not something that I necessarily wanted to associate with. I, for, for me, there was something about the term homesteader that was kind of a bit off-putting. I just have to admit, it was, it was kind of like that unwashed... Masses. Bib, bib overall, straw hat. Yeah, I don't know, straw, just house know. falling down. Yeah, it just it was it was not something that I had a very positive <laughs> perspective of. So when you started referring to yourself as a homesteader, I, honestly I was just like, oh mom, no, <laughs> no, let's not go there. Uh, and then when I got the American guinea hogs and I was researching them, and as I've shared this on the podcast before. That's really when I drew the connection between what we were doing, which I just really saw as living, because that's what I grew up around. And again, we had different times, different seasons. That was a part of our life. But I just saw that as living. And then when I got the American guinea hogs, I discovered the whole online homesteading community. Then I was oh, maybe mom knew what she was talking <laughs> about after all. <laughs> I don't even know where I, I first started or when or why I first started using that term homestead. I don't remember a specific thing happening, but I knew to me it, it was a self-sustaining idea where I don't have to depend on others. You know, I, I depend on what we do right here for our livelihood. And you know, if it ever gets to the place where we don't have jobs, for whatever reason, we have a way of supporting ourselves without depending on others. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely something I think that we, and I think all three of us, when I say three of us, my, my two brothers and I, I think we inherited from you guys is a very, very strong sense of independence. Like we don't want to be beholden to anybody. We don't want to have to depend on anybody, which I think has good qualities, but I think there's and sometimes bad. where it's maybe a bad thing as well. But certainly, I think that's something that comes through. That's It's kind of a hallmark of a homesteader is that desire for um, independence and just not wanting to be beholden or dependent on anybody. Well, which, it's like the older... It, it is bad because... Like, I know you're busy, but it's raining, and the roof is blowing off the house, so I'm going to crawl up the ladder and slip on the roof, and because you're busy, and I don't have time to call you up there. And um, that, by the way, is a real-life example. About a month ago, my dad's, <laughs> was it the chimney cap blew off or something? So, and and I, and I find uh, on Facebook a picture of my... I hate to use the term dad, but you just got to own it. Elderly father up on the roof because he was too darn stubborn to call his son to come up and help him out. So, um, but yes. But so there is that sense of independence, which is a negative thing. Um, because like growing up in Victory Mills, I would say to somebody, um, we can do it ourselves. And they said, but you're denying somebody else a blessing by allowing them to help you. And that's a, that's a hard pill to swallow, mm -hmm. to really have to ask for help. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a hard pill to swallow. Um, but then again, homesteading to me is it's not a chore. Mm -hmm. I... To me, it's a, it's a hobby. Don't I'm, listen, tax man. It's not a hobby. It's not a hobby, tax man. I, <laughs> I love doing it. Mm -hmm. I would rather 
do that. I would rather be out in the garden mm -hmm. than painting. Oh, amen, amen. <laughs> yeah. Woo. That, that's one thing we are, I inherited definitely from you. In fact, I have a painting project here. Our, our house, it's a great room. We're, in fact, sitting right now in the dining room portion of the great room. And probably about eight years ago, I started painting this, and I got about, oh... I don't know, I got two and a half walls done and the other wall never got done. And if I were to do it now, I'd have to start all over from scratch. So I definitely inherited that from my dad. There's no doubt. But yeah, I think there's a sense to where um, when, and again, it goes back to what you were saying, mom, with regards to living in community, when we're helping each other out, whether it's family, um, blood family, or whether it's homesteading family, but helping each other out, there's a blessing that comes from that and that giving and helping other people teaching other people's skills, demonstrating to people who don't know how to can, how to can, uh, demonstrating to people who don't know how to garden, how to garden. And to me, that's I, I gain a lot of joy and satisfaction from that because my hope is that we're not just, we're not just doing this for ourselves, but Nan and Papa did it and, and Aunt Mill and Uncle Ron did it and it kind of got passed down to you guys. And then it, it's been passed down to me. And, you know, whether or not Brian Jade de decides to do it, who knows? Right now, he loves the chickens. He'll help me with the pigs. He'll begrudgingly help in the garden. He loves to eat the food. Um, but he doesn't really have any grand designs on being a homesteader. But you know what? I didn't either. In fact, you've said many times, Mom, out of your three boys, mm -hmm. I was the one that you would have voted least likely to succeed. To, to, yeah. you know, not to succeed. I knew he would succeed, but to, to, to be a homesteader or a farmer, I, you would rather lay on the couch and read a book where the other guys went out and climbed trees and did all the physical stuff. And uh, it's just been interesting to actually <coughs> develop and, and see the homestead that you have put together. And you're one lucky man, my son, because your wife is right by your side. You can't do this way of life, and I, I consider it a way of life. It's it's not just a hobby or 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 something passing. It's a way of life for me. Mm. And you know, I plan to do this until I die, and then you can mm. bury me on the homestead. <laughs> <laughs> I one hundred percent agree. I think that homesteading, if you if you do it right, it is it really it goes back to what I said, where it's just living. It's just living life. And certainly there's an element of joy that comes from it. And it, it can take the place of hobbies. I don't golf. And not, not that there's anything wrong with golfing. You know, there are a lot of quote unquote hobbies that people are involved in that that time, effort, energy, and money I put into my homestead. And I don't say that and pat myself on the back. It's just, for me, it's a way of life. But it also does, you know, there is that hobby enjoyment element that comes from it well um, i find happiness there you know there, satisfaction satisfaction and happiness and then of course you know when i have a spare minute or two i get out my quilting and that brings me even more happiness because then i have quilts to put on my bed to me i would consider quilting as a part of homesteading i think it's just another avenue of being crafty and thrifty. So to me, that that's something that fits within the realm of homesteading. A lot of times we think of homesteading simply from the standpoint of raising and growing food, but I think it really goes beyond that. In fact, one of my favorite books is Back to Basics. In fact, to this day, it is my favorite homesteading book of all time. And there's a lot of things in there like soap making and leather working and, you know, different components to homesteading that maybe sometimes we don't think about, but I think fall into that area. Well, I think another part is the, the rocking chairs on the front porch where you sit and watch the evening sun and, and see the beautiful sunsets and, and it brings peas. a sense of peace. Mm -hmm. You can, yeah, you can shell peas or you can Snap do different beans. things while you're sitting there, but even <clears throat> just to sit, somehow our busy world has lost the idea that it's really okay to relax some mm -hmm. and rest your body and rest your mind and and get ideas so that you can continue 
-hmm. doing what you're doing in a peaceful the the regular world is so busy rushing to work and rushing to get things done their projects done and then rushing home and rushing to make a meal and rushing to get the next day's lunches ready and rushing to get the kids to bed it's rush 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 but that's not really why we were put here on earth Mm -hmm. There is mm -hmm. nothing wrong, and we have to somehow convey this to people, there is nothing wrong to taking some time to relax. Now, not relaxing all day long. You have mm -hmm. to find the balance. But there's nothing wrong with sitting on your front porch, shelling peas, and watching the sunset. Yeah. And, and having meaningful conversations right. one with the other. Yeah, and that's, and that's something that I've, and I've shared on the podcast about that, but that's been a growing edge for me is to sit on the front porch and not feel guilty about sitting on the front porch. As I watch the sunset, as I enjoy the sounds of the ducks and the geese and the chickens and the pigs and the turkeys, uh, but finding enjoyment in the homestead and not just seeing it from the standpoint of, Oh my goodness, I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to do the next thing because the to-do list is, is never ending. If you're doing homesteading correctly, I think the to-do to list, because there's always something new that you can learn. There's always something new that you can try. There's always something new that you can add. Um, and so finding that enjoyment of just sitting on the front porch in the rocking chair, shelling peas, snapping beans, or sometimes just watching the sunset, I think is great. Or quilting or knitting. <laughs> quilting, knitting, yeah. Reading, uh, reading uh, the Grit magazine or whatever. Yeah. There, there's a whole lot of different magazines that have good information in them. I, I know some people don't believe in God. Um, and you, if you want to edit this out, that's up to you. Hmm. But I personally feel that, that God gave us the homestead. You know that we have a deep faith, that we attend church regularly, um, and that we depend on God for the good times and cry to him in the bad times because it, the reality says it's not everything sweet on, on the homestead. Mm -hmm. And uh, there have been a number of times where, you know, we have prayed and God has, has answered. Mm -hmm. And it he's a big part of our homestead. He's a big part of why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's I think that's something really important because I think sometimes we as homesteaders have a have a tendency to oversell homesteading from the standpoint of we show the pretty pictures, we show the, you know, the the cute little animals, but we don't usually show the animal that that didn't make it because it, it got hit by a hawk or the the jars that blew up in the canner. Um, you know, sometimes there are there are times on the homestead when the 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 vegetables don't grow the way we want them to grow. They don't look like the vegetables in the picture. Yeah, yeah. And so, to to really understand that, you know, there are going to be times on the homestead when things don't go according to plan, and how do you handle that? And I think for for both of us, both of our homesteads, our faith is a huge part of of what we do, and you know, our reliance, at the end of the day, we rely on God. And we believe that God has entrusted us, us with skills and, and abilities and thought processes and so forth. And we try to do the best we can and learn and grow as individuals. But at the end of the day, it's God who brings the, the rain. It's God who brings the sunshine. It's God who brings the wind. And we rely on, on him and so our faith, I think, is a huge component of this. My thoughts go to, I don't know if it was two or three years ago, I was working as a nurse full-time, didn't have time to do up the tomatoes, and they predicted a frost. And I didn't want to lose all those tomatoes, so I prayed. The next day on Facebook, my friend who lives probably a half a mile down in, way down in back of where we, we live, stated that they got hit with a hard frost and my tomatoes never got hit. And I know a lot of people will think that I'm kind of out in left field, but I know that God heard my prayer and, mm -hmm. and preserved my tomatoes so I could can some. And, mm -hmm. I, and I mean that sincerely. Mm -hmm. I, I credit that. Mm -hmm. 
one of the blessings too of of raising a lot more than we can use is I get enjoyment out of sharing mm -hmm. and not so much this year because of the COVID nonsense, but last year we took literally baskets of vegetables to church and said, help yourself. And people really appreciated them. Mm -hmm. I took some to work <laughs> and my coworkers just loved the fresh vegetables. It's, mm -hmm. it's a joy to share. Absolutely. What we have. Yeah, and there's a, there's a lot of satisfaction that comes from homesteading, whether it's the satisfaction that you gain from sharing with other people, whether it's sharing produce, sharing meat, sharing knowledge, and there's also the satisfaction that you get when you sit down to a meal like we sat down today, and you look at the plate, and on that plate, almost everything that was on that plate either came from our homestead, your homestead, a combination of the two, uh, or it was in the case of, for example, the corn, it's corn that we purchased off of another homesteader or farmer. We processed it ourselves. But again, we had a hand in everything that was on that plate today. Mm -hmm. I think there might have been a handful of potatoes that we bought, we bought at the store. But even some of those potatoes were ones that we ra raised and grew here. And so there's a huge amount of satisfaction. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me here on the homestead journey. Again, you guys are my favorite homesteaders. No lie, I, I just am very, very thankful and blessed uh, that we live so close that we get to do this together uh, and we get to pluck chickens together and we get to, you you skated on the ducks and the geese yesterday, but uh, um, <laughs> we'll get we'll give you a pass. But we, we've made a lot of memories, pigs. We have. We've been pigs together. Um, I've got to get a beehive down here so you can do that. Yeah, we need we need to, we need to do that. Maybe maybe next year that'll be our next step. Who knows? But well, uh, we anyhow. thank you for the opportunity of sharing our way of life, right. and we're really glad that it, the bug got you and you're going strong with it. <laughs> All right, thanks, thanks, guys. Love you. Love you too. Love you too. Well, I certainly hope that you enjoyed that interview. I really enjoyed spending time just talking homesteading with my mom and dad today. And it's just a very, very special thing for me to share that interest with them and to have such great mentors in both my mom and dad as we work together and we journey together towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, and even if you didn't, I'd love to hear from you. Brian at the homesteadjourney.net is my email address, or you can reach out to us on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, on MeWe. All of the links to our social media is in the show notes. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so in a number of different ways. As I mentioned earlier, we do have a Teespring shop, so teespring slash stores slash the Homestead Journey podcast. Check that out for some fabulous t-shirt designs with some more that I've got in my head that I've just got to get down on paper. Well, digital paper, but you know what I mean. <laughs> you can also support the show by sharing the podcast with friends, family, enemy, anybody. Share the show with people that you think might find it beneficial. You can also support the show by going to thehomesteadjourney.net slash shop, and there you will find a list of affiliate links to Amazon. These are items that we use on our homestead, but not do we just use them, we actually like using them. So if it's on there, we recommend it. Check that out, thehomesteadjourney.net slash shop. That's it for this week's episode. As always, the music was provided by audionautics.com. So a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.